about that time. So good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Make sure you're all comfortable, but not too comfortable. Um, I won't take offense if you all fall asleep because these chairs do look very, very nice. Um, I will apologize. I haven't had breakfast this morning and my stomach keeps going rah. So if in the middle of my talk you hear some weird noises, that will be my stomach. I do apologize. Um, let's get started. So my name is Jamie Lee Coleman. Um, a little bit about me. Helps if I turn this on. There we go. Um, I'm a developer advocate for Sonatype. I worked at IBM for most of my career, left about a year ago. Um, actually started on mainframes originally, so modernizing the mainframe testing infrastructure into Java. Um, worked on WebSphere, you probably know WebSphere a little bit. Um, worked on Open Liberty a little bit, and now I work for Sonatype. So, hands up, anyone heard of Sonatype before? Anyone use some? Oh, wow, this is cool, okay. Um, so, Sonatype, you probably know us for Maven Central, which is what I'm talking about today. Um, but Sonatype do lots of other things as well. We were the first ever um, component repository in the world, and of course, we do lots of lots of other things. So, a little bit. We'll start off by talking about why we love open source, and you probably all know why we love open source. You know, we've got the main freedoms here: study, copy, modify, distribute, etc. We talked about, they talked about community a lot in the opening keynotes, et cetera, and that's why open source is amazing, because it's a collection of people coming together to work on a project, um, and that can have lots of benefits. Now, if we rewind, say, 20, 30 years ago, we didn't use a lot of open source code, whereas now pretty much our applications that we build are 90% made up of someone else's code which is great because it means we don't have to rewrite that stuff over and over again. If it's already there, someone shared it, it means we can use it, which is amazing. Um, imagine how much it would stifle innovation if we had to write all the dependencies, all the functionality we take for granted today with open source. But there are issues around this, of course. Um, so if you take an average Java project, for example, there are 150 dependencies in that Java project. Those dependencies will have roughly average about 10 updates a year. So we have to consider one and a half thousand updates a year. And it's a bit of a mundane, boring task. So it's not something we want to have to go, go through with all the time. Um, it's something we'd like to try and automate. And then of course we download dependencies. So this is Spring, for example. That will pull in more dependencies, more dependencies, dependencies, et cetera, et cetera. So we use a lot of open source code, um, a lot more than we we'd like to think about, which is amazing, again. So I'm here to talk to you about Maven Central. So Maven Central, realistically, is the main place that a lot of us get our Java dependencies from. Um, I presume most, of, hands up who uses Maven Central or downloads from Maven Central, yep, yeah, awesome. Hands up who actually contributes or puts stuff onto Maven Central. Is there anyone here? Okay, there's a few of you, awesome, okay. Um, so Maven Central, it's, it's a thing because of you. It's something Sonatype has run and hosted for a very, very long time. Um, it's something we do for the community. So we all kind of find ourselves, you know, we're trying to find something, we end up on Maven, Maven Central, blah, 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 and then we find the component we want, download it, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's very, very easy to get these things. As we all know, we just add it to our POM file, et cetera, or put it into our Gradle file, whatever, um, to download. And Maven Central doesn't just do Java. Um, we host a lot of libraries for different things as well, like Kotlin, blah, 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 et cetera. Um, but like I mentioned, 90% of modern applications, they are made up of other people's code. And if we look at some of the most um, prominent things in on Maven, um, GitHub, you'll see pom Maven poms are pretty much everywhere, especially in the Java space. Um, and we're all used to this, you know, you pull down something, you just want a simple library and you end up waiting, it's pulling down more and more dependencies, etc. And this is something we all take for granted, it's something we do. Um, so that's just a bit of an outline of what we're going to talk about today. So what, basically what is Maven Central, um, why we need Maven Central to evolve. As you probably noticed, you'll see Maven Central, the actual website's changed recently. Um, a few people asked why, et cetera. Well, I don't know if you saw the old Maven Central website, but it was pretty old. It looked like it was built in the 90s, so one of the reasons that we tried to update it. Um, I've got a little bit of homework for you all, uh, which is um, fun homework, hopefully, and at the end, obviously, question and answers. So Maven Central, it seems like it's been with us for a very long time. 
Um, it kind of it started out basically under my boss's desk. So again, 1999. This was kind of the style. Again, I couldn't find a pitch, or the actual picture of what was there. But again, Maven Central started as something very simple. Um, my boss, Brian Fox, he's the co-founder of Sonatype and Jason. They are the guys that basically are instrumental in creating Maven Central. These are some of the original Maven contributors. And essentially how it kind of started out was my boss was going around the world teaching people how to use Maven. And he saw a problem that, OK, we've got this great build tool that can easily build things. But where do we go and fetch these dependencies from? There isn't a central place to do that. So he went about building Maven Central. This was running under a computer under his desk. As you can imagine, it doesn't run on a computer under someone's desk anymore. Um, it runs on AWS, so you can imagine how much that costs us. Um, but uh, obviously, it outgrew its origins. So again, um, it was funded by public donations at the beginning, but then Sonatype um, took over basically running this because it was a very, very expensive thing to do. Um, so 2002, why have we changed it? Well, we really need to add some innovation. As you can see, this is very different to the original Maven Central website you're all used to. And like I mentioned, it outgrew its origins. Like Maven Central is, is very, very heavily used. I think this year alone, we had half a trillion downloads from Maven Central. So you can imagine the throughput and how much AWS actually charges is uh, <laughs> quite a lot of money. Um, it's, it's not very complicated architecture, to be honest. It's very, very much based on Nexus repository. So we basically have our publishers, some of you here. Yeah, you'll publish and it'll go into a Nexus repository. Uh, repo users will use Fastly and Bitbucket and things like that. And search users come in and basically use Jenkins, blah, 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 to pull down and retrieve what they want. So it's not very difficult architecture, very, very simple. Um, of course, we have APIs. I mean, everything is, we all need APIs in our industry to try and automate processes as much as possible. Now, there is a lot of data behind this. Because Sonatype run Maven Central, we have a lot of data to, um, to, to look through. Um, we can see who's downloading what, where they're downloading it from, what regions are downloading certain libraries more, what regions are downloading certain libraries less. And one of the things we produce every year is the state of the software supply chain. So this is a report that comes out. It came out about a few weeks ago. And it has loads of information, not just for Java, but for basically the whole supply chain in total. So if we're comparing some of the open source repos that are out there, um, Java, as you can see, is still very OK. We don't have as many projects as some of the others, um, because I think our projects are a bit more robust. We don't have loads of random little new projects, but we have a lot of, you know, Lots of projects on there. And again, as you can see, the year-on-year -year growth is still growing. Year-on-year um, -year download growth is still growing. So again, um, Java is still a very, very healthy language. Now, if we go back a few, well, one year, I guess, um, we were at 8.8 .8 million stored components, 27 terabytes of files, and 79 different namespace organizations and publishers. So a lot, a lot of stuff is on Maven Central. Um, and in 2021, developers around the world made more than 496 billion requests to Maven Central. And because that's exponentially growing, that is a lot more nowadays. And Java as an ecosystem is still growing. Um, as you can see, uh, we've got new projects. These are new projects. Uh, the yellow is net new projects. These are existing projects that are maintained. So Java is still a very, very healthy ecosystem. And again, I think that's kind of because of the community that it, that's around it. Um, Java, through the first seven months of 2023, we had 512 billion Java components downloaded from Maven Central. So that was just in seven months. I think now we've hit something like two and a half trillion downloads from Maven Central. Um, so a massive, massive amount of people consuming stuff, which is great. Um, but in the end, running Maven Central is very, very expensive for us. Um, again, something we do for the community just to help Java developers around the world. We don't get any money for that. Um, and one of the reasons I kind of do my job as a developer advocate is because Sonatype is really bad at telling anyone, A, we run Maven Central, or B, um, we do this for the community. So one of the reasons I go around doing this. And by the way, I've done this talk quite a few times. This is going to be the last time I do this talk. I keep submitting it, and it keeps getting accepted. So should I be privileged, this will be the last time I will ever do this talk again. <laughs> um, but there's one more thing that costs us a lot of money, um, and that's keeping our applications safe. 
Now, again, going back 30 years, we weren't borrowing as much code. We were writing everything ourselves. Whereas now we are borrowing other people's code into our applications, which is great because we're all sharing stuff. But that means there are certain problems, certain things that are emerging nowadays that are a bit problematic for the open source space. So Maven Central actually is quite good. If we compare it to the Python repositories and the Node repositories, there was decisions made at the beginning when we created Maven Central that have protected Java developers quite well. Um, so first one is proof of ownership. If you're submitting anything to Maven Central, you have to own that domain. So com.apache.something. So no random person can come in and put a new version of a dependency unless they own that domain. And this was a decision made right at the beginning. Now, Node and Python, all those repositories, they don't have that. And if you look at their repositories, they are full of malware, full of vulnerabilities. So this is the, really the first layer of protection. Um, so this helps, again, with dependency confusion because basically you have to own the domain. This helps with the second one, which is typo squatting. So as you can see, log J4 rather than log for J. Again, fix because you have to own the domain. It doesn't stop this, though. Someone could create a new domain with a slightly different spelling. Um, and as a developer, you know, we've all done it. We've accidentally mistyped something or downloaded a dependency. This is, how, this is bad. This is how the bad guys get into our systems. And that is one thing that we, can't, we haven't solved with this, but it's something we're trying to work on to solve. Now, like I mentioned, Python, um, they're really bad um, at like, handling what goes into their repositories, full of malware, full of vulnerabilities. Um, and again, the decisions we made at the beginning um, helped us fix that. But stuff is hard. I mean, now we've got to deal with all these dependencies, all these updates. Managing this just stifles innovation, really. Um, so what we're trying to do with Maven Central is give you, the developer, the user of Maven Central, more insight into what you're downloading. Well, first of all, Sonatype, what we do as a company is we're a software supply chain company. We specialize in security in the software supply chain. And we basically scan everything that goes into Maven Central with our, uh, our um, scanners which is great because it basically stops any malware getting into there. So we don't have any malware pretty much go up. I can't even remember the last time I saw some malware in Maven Central. So that is the first kind of level of protection we have. Um, now we're trying to put in different things. So basically a way for you to see before you even download if there are any vulnerabilities in the version you're trying to download. I think this is critical because by the time you've downloaded it and it's hit your computer system and you've built the application, you are now then vulnerable. So stopping that happening before um, it gets to your system is a part of one of the things we're trying to do uh, for Maven Central. So why does this actually matter? Why should we as developers care about security? Why should we care about what's in our vulnerabilities? Well, last year alone, Sonatype found 245,000 vulnerable packages, mainly not in Java, so we're all lucky there, again, because of some of the decisions made with Maven Central, but that's a lot of packages in one year. Um, if we look at average vulnerabilities per country, um, I've singled out the Netherlands here. Um, you guys aren't doing too bad, but you know, you're know you not at the bottom, so definitely, definitely a level there for improving. Um, but again, we have a lot of this information because we run Maven Central. We can see who's downloading what, who's downloading what vulnerable packages. So why should we all worry a little bit about this? Well, if we think um, about the drug trade, for example, in 2016, uh, cybercrime surpassed the drug trade. So cybercrime was making 450 US billion dollars a year. That's $14,000 a second, and that's equivalent to 50 of the world's biggest nuclear aircraft carriers. Bear in mind, I think the US has about 10, 15 of these. So in 2016, cybercrime was earning enough money to build 50 of these. Now, imagine in 2022, the reason I've got 2022, because that's what I've got data on, it's a lot more. So if we go to 2022, we're looking at six trillion US dollars a year. That's 200,000 US dollars uh, a second. That is equivalent to 620 of the world's biggest nuclear aircraft carriers. So that is absolutely huge. 
And if cybercrime was, uh, if we put the GDP of a country, it would be the third largest country in terms of GDP in the world. Now, I recently spoke in India and I had to swap these rounds. Um, they thought that was hilarious, but yeah, um, because India just took over the UK in terms of GDP. But that's an amazing, that's a scary, scary amount of money. Um, and to be honest, do you think this guy right here, do you think he would bother with drugs nowadays? Well, we all know what happens to him. Anyone, generally people are in the illegal drug trade. Um, it doesn't end well for them. Whereas cyber criminals, they very, very rarely get caught and they make a lot of money. Um, so I believe if he was around today, he wouldn't bother with drugs. He would probably just be a hacker and have a, a room full of hackers taking money from people all over the world. And this is more important nowadays. I mean, we all know probably Log4J. Um, but if we go back to 2006, when a vulnerability was announced, we had on average about 45 days to fix that before a hacker or someone would come in and start attacking our system. What we learned with Log4J nowadays is that window is now down to one or two days. So when Log4J, that vulnerability was announced, the bad people around the world, they realized how heavily used that library is. And they went on a massive storm just to attack as many people as possible. Now, that's a bit worrying because nowadays, open source code is in everything. It's in insulin pumps. I'm not shitting you. It's in insulin pumps. It's in aircraft. It's in self-driving cars. It's in trains. So we're borrowing all this code from all these people that we don't even know halfway across the world that's going into some of our national infrastructure. Um, and we're not thinking too much about the vulnerability side of things. And unfortunately, as and I don't want to you know, be mean to us all as developers, but we're pretty slow at changing. Now, if we, again, we have log for da data. We know exactly who's downloading what. We know what versions they're downloading. And this was in, when was this? This was May 2021, so, um, May 2022, sorry. So this was about six months after Log4J had been released, that vulnerable version. Still, at that point, 33% of downloads in the, that last 24 hours were that vulnerable version. That's 51 million downloads of a, one of the worst, worst vulnerabilities ever in our industry. Can you imagine, you, you would hope as, as developers we would have changed. This is the latest snapshot I took this morning. 22% of all downloads of Log4J is still that vulnerable version. Bear in mind, this was one of the worst vulnerabilities in existence. And to date, there has been 285 million downloads of that vulnerable version of Log4J. Now, we humans are actually, to be fair, you Dutch, you're probably actually quite good. You're quite, quite a proactive nation, but generally, Humans are a reactive nation. We tend to react to problems when they occur rather than trying to fix problems before they happen. And the reason I am saying you guys are all generally quite good at this is because look at your green energy infrastructure, look at everything you've done. You are pioneering the way in terms of that kind of stuff. But humans, we're not very good at that generally as a race. And this is an example. So we know who's downloading what versions from what countries, etc. And here's an example of how we are reactive. So the Log4J came out. Um, Taiwan, and we know China and Taiwan, they don't have the best relations. Um, they, China basically went on a massive hacking spree to basically take down as much infrastructure in Taiwan as possible. And of course, being humans, they reacted to that. So now they are now one of the best countries in terms of Log4J downloads because they got hit so hard that they were trying to make sure that never ever happens to them again. Now, there are loads of ways, very simple ways, we can get started basically increasing our security, like really, really simple ways to get started. So these are some of the main factors that people look at. So OpenSSF have kind of um, a, a scale and a way they look at open source projects, how they rate them, if they're good health and if they're not good health, and these are some of the ways they do that. But you'll be surprised at how many people, like, so the higher things here are things that we can do quite easily um, and that's the main factors in a open source project is their health. Now, as you can see, simple things like branch protection, like so many people don't have branch protection. Um, code reviews, I mean, I've come from an IBM background where we always did code reviews. Nothing would ever even get into our pipeline without doing code reviews. But these are just very, very simple things we can all do as developers 
to essentially start improving our security without having to put much effort into it. So how have the bad guys evolved over the years? Well, before, they used to be hacking for money. They were doing it to make much profit as possible. Whereas things have changed nowadays. These are national countries, these are nation states, not doing this for money, but doing this to take down other countries' infrastructure. So our power infrastructure, maybe our medical infrastructure, even our shops. And they don't do this straight away. They don't say, oh, I've got a vulnerability, I am going to attack them now. They might wait for a national holiday. They'll wait for the perfect time to do as much damage as possible. So this is why we have to pay more and more attention to security these days than we did 20, 30 years ago. And of course, with security these days, um, we have a lot more things to think about. We have microservices, we have all this small architecture, whereas before we just had one big monolith, so we just had to care about the security in that rather than all these hundreds of services. Um, so the field of battle, like I mentioned, we've got stuff like typo squatting, dependency confusion, uh, vulnerability exploitation, um, build system compromise, because our build systems, guess what? They're all made up of open source dependencies as well, so they're getting attacked. Um, an open source project compromise. So I was talking to someone in Maven the other day, and I was asking, what happens if, say, I own the Apache domain, and I gave that to someone else? Would you have any knowledge of that? And they, we really don't. It's a bit of a scary thing, and it's very difficult to figure that out. Um, the amount of requests we get with people going, oh, I've lost the domain, or oh, uh, I don't have the original email, that's not a simple, easy, automated process. It's a case-by-case -case basis we have to go through, because imagine if a bad actor got hold of one of the main libraries, one of the main domains that we have, they could put all kinds of bad stuff in there, and we would just automatically download that, thinking, yes, we trust Apache, well, we trust them, we trust blah, 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 but it's very easy for people to attack these repos. And that is what hackers and bad people are doing nowadays. They are going after the stuff we consume massively without thinking. They're trying to get vulnerabilities put into there. And again, that's why Maven Central is evolving. It's evolving to give you, as a developer, as the consumer of open source um, code, more insight into what's going on. So, of course, there's things like signing required for publishers. Um, publishers will be able to use the same UI, but again, having stuff like that makes it a bit easier. Um, SBOM support is something, if you don't know about it, SBOMs are software bill of materials. It's something that's coming um, to basically, when you download a dependency, you can get an SBOM with it, so you'll see what that dependency includes, and basically look at the internals of, the, um, of what you're downloading. Of course, there's lots of organizations, um, OpenSSF, et cetera, are all um, trying to essentially um, put some standards in place to make sure we're not just downloading really, really bad stuff. And again, if you can think of any other way that can, we can increase um, security with our with our repository, because again, it is a community room repository. It's something we don't make money from. Um, please just let us know, let me know, et cetera. Um, any ideas are welcome. And of course, there are lots of other things we can do. There's lots of other applications. So Lifecycle is a, something that's um, Sonatype build, which basically looks at your application at every point of its lifecycle to monitor exactly what dependencies are going in, um, what vulnerabilities are in those dependencies, uh, are there any um, alternative options to those? So it'll give you, it can do automatic pull requests, so things like that. There are lots of tools out there to basically help you manage your dependencies because it's a boring task. We just want to, we just want to concentrate on innovation. We don't want to be sitting there managing dependencies, etc. And of course, we, the, having scores. So again, something OpenSSS has done, they've created the scorecard, which essentially allows you to score different open source projects to give you an idea of kind of how, how good it is to use that. So popularity is one, like how many people are using this, how many vulnerabilities it has. Um, security doesn't just mean that. Security can mean, for example, if a vulnerability comes out, how long does it take that open source project to release an update to fix that? So all these things are considered, and it will give you a score at the end of it. And again, um, we have lots of different intelligence, so we can figure out exactly what versions are the best ones to go to. Um, we can avoid different uh, specific versions, and again, if there's breaking changes and things like that, they're all considered. So lots of different insights from Maven Central. And again, there's, di there's, there's different rules for using the, the optimal version. Now, I wouldn't say always go to latest. Latest is not a good practice because 
Um, latest just means you're getting the, the, the newest version, but it, might, it hasn't been tested. It hasn't been used in the wild, wild. So there could be lots of vulnerabilities in there. So there are different practices, essentially, um, that you need to go through to think about when you're making your updates and you're updating your dependencies. Um, so one last little thing. I've gone way too ahead of myself, probably because I'm a bit hungry today. Um, one last little thing I wanted to go through was um, a bit of homework for you all. Now, as you've probably noticed, Maven Central's logo hasn't changed for a very, very, very long time. Um, and we want to get you, as the community, to essentially come up with ideas for a new logo. Um, so what I was planning to do was essentially get you all to use any of these AI image generation tools, throw whatever you think you can think in there. We want something nice, funny, you know, something that's relatable to everyone, um, and just send them to Sonatype. Send them to me, send them to Sonatype, send them to whoever, because we want to essentially replace the logo and we want to crowdsource it from you. So if you've got any ideas for a cool logo for Maven Centrin, feel free to share them with me, with Sonatype, whoever, um, and then we'll basically eventually put them all together, run a competition, and get people to vote on which one's the favorite. So again, if you want to contact me and send any of those things, just please do. Um, if you've got any questions after this, feel free to message me. Um, again, I'm sorry, I've ran this very, very quickly because I, I think my stomach's a bit hungry. But the good thing is, you, as Dutch people, you speak very, very good English, so you've probably managed to keep up with me. Whereas if I was in a different country, they would all be complaining at the end that I've gone too quick. So um, yeah, thank you all for speaking good English. Um, you actually speak better English than most of the British do, so yeah, <laughs> kudos for that. Um, so without further ado, I'm just going to go, is there any questions um, from you all before I finish? Um, I will let you go a little bit early, like I said, and I'm going to go find some food because all I've had is a Kit Kat this morning. <laughs> yes, question. Yeah, what's your view on an internal repository, like uh, compared to downloading directly from Maven Central? I think y security? if you don't have an internal repository, you should 100% have one because that is your kind of first line of defense from bad stuff getting directly onto your developer's laptops. Yeah, but your whole pitch is that Maven Central is getting more secure. So yes, yeah, Maven Central is getting more secure, but that doesn't is not an ex <laughs> sorry, carry on. Yeah, why then have an internal one? Um, because Maven Central is getting secure, but it's not going to get to the point that um, it's going to protect you fully. And that's not that's just Maven. Again, with Maven, we are a bit more secure. But most organizations don't just do Java. They'll do Node, they'll do Python, they'll do lots of languages. No, I'm talking about Maven. OK, Maven. well, I still think, personally, that you should have an extra line of defense, because this doesn't stop you downloading bad stuff. It just gives you some insight. But that requires you to go and do the research, whereas I guarantee most people here won't go and do that. They'll still just pull down stuff in their Maven POM files without researching it. So an internal repository basically gives you a kind of first line of defense, because you're pulling into this repository first, um, and then you can look there to make sure you can manage it a little bit, what's allowed, what's not. But there are lots of other tools. So for example, Sonatype has a, tool, um, a product called Firewall. And that sits between your external repository and your internal repository. And how that works is essentially you pull down a dependency. It will go through Firewall. Um, Firewall uses AI machine learning to scan it. And it uses our industrial scanners to do that. If it's, we've seen it before, and we know it's fine. Um, you basically set up policies what you allow through, but if it's fine, okay, it can go into your internal repo, you can download it. If it's not sure, it goes to our security research team, and there's a lot of them, there's about 100 of these people, and within 15 to 20 minutes, they will figure out if that has vulnerabilities in. And then, obviously, if we know it's bad and you set policies up to not allow that, um, it'll stop it happening. So. The internal repo isn't a defense by itself, but it's the first step into building infrastructure that will help protect you. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thanks. We also no have Nexus IQ. So that's okay, cool. Yeah, so similar things like that. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks. No worries. And yeah, with Firewall, it is kind of like, it is these people, I've watched some of these engineers that go through this code line by line, and they've seen it all before. I mean, a lot of the time, they'll, this, you'll download a library, it'll go and fetch something from here, which will pull a script from here. It doesn't do, they don't do the same thing over and over again. 
But these guys, this is their day job. Every day, they are scanning dependencies to look at the same things that are happening, but in different ways, ways that are trying to trick our scanners. So essentially, they go through them. They update the, the learning models for the AI and the machine learning to say, don't let this through. Um, and then if someone tweaks that vulnerability, um, it will go in, back in. Will they'll, The scanner will look at it and go, I'm not sure, and the security research team. So internal repositories, again, like I said, are just the first line of defense, but all the other tools you add around them are required to really make your, your system secure. Any other questions? Yes. So the way it works uh, to, to publish to MEF Central is you build it on your own system, you, you uh, deploy it uh, and sign it as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I know there are some discussions about is your own system, can it be trusted? There could also be some vulnerabilities there that are now uploaded into MEF Central and signing is not the, 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 the protection, it's only yep. save that you did it. Yep. Uh, are there ideas how to prevent this? Yes, yeah, so like I said, generally um, with Maven Central, our industry scanners, they scan everything. So malware pretty much never gets in. What we find with Java and Maven is it's not bad people putting vulnerabilities in, it's mistakes. It's generally mistakes that cause the vulnerabilities. So Log4J wasn't a bad actor getting into Log4J and doing something bad. It was a mistake they made that they didn't realize about. And the problem is with that. Um, so generally, so your question was more about if someone bad got infiltrated your personal laptop um, and put some stuff in there. Generally, that would be kind of, they're trying to put malware in and we would stop that anyway. So that there's protection there to kind of stop that. Now, in terms of mistakes and vulnerabilities like that, unfortunately, there isn't really a very good way to stop that. Um, like you mentioned, signing is one way to make sure it hasn't been tampered with, etc. But um, no, there isn't. And like I said, we're always here for open for suggestions on how we can improve and stop that happening. Um, it's very, very difficult. And people ask, why don't you remove bad stuff from Maven Central? Well, we, again, a lot of these things are mistakes. And it's not like um, Node, et cetera, where you do an in, we basically run your application and instantly any malware or anything in there is executed generally. With Java, you have to hit that bit of code that has the bad vulnerability in. So for us, people ask, why don't you remove these versions down? Well, they might not be mistakes. People have automation that pulls stuff down from Maven Central. We can't go and break the world's automation. So it's kind of, we leave it to your responsibility to make sure you don't pull down that bad stuff. Now, again, with malware, we stop that. Um, but kind of to answer your question, we have industry, industrial scanners that scan it, but there isn't really a way to stop uh, for us to know if a bad actor put, you know, tweaked a bit of code to make it fail, you know, do a, um, yeah, to, to do something bad. So there isn't really a way, but if you can think of one, do let me know. <laughs> I know there, there are some ideas about um, um, decentralized repositories where yeah. they even build it and then publish it, something like that. So yeah. it's not being built on your own system, but then again, how do you sign it? I, that's not possible anymore, right? Yeah, um, and of course, that gets expensive. Imagine if we had to build everything that went into Maven Central. Um, it already costs us um, millions and millions a year just to run Maven Central. So trying to scan and build everything that's put up there, I think we're probably bankrupt, <laughs> to be honest. <clears throat> it is an idea. But it's something that we don't fight. We financially just can't do. It, it probably costs more than what we make. So it is an idea and it is a way of doing it. But again, um, it's just very, very costly. I mean, running this for free is costly enough. So yeah. But again, any ideas? Do do let me know. <laughs> any ideas that aren't going to break make us bankrupt? Yeah. Um, hopefully that answered your question or responded. Yeah. Any other questions? I knew there was one at the back. Yes. You're welcome to shout or. It's all right. He he he's got um, running clothes on. He'll, he'll get there. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, the company I work for, we really uh, value security. Uh, awesome. I believe we have three uh, library scanners. Running, right. Cool. And we have active groups that monitor and uh, gives reports on that. We have tools like Renovate running to upgrade dependencies. Yep. We try to minimize our dependencies to as low as possible. Awesome. 
what's, what can we do more to, to stay secure? Because it's, it's, it feel, feels like an uphill battle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, every, every sprint we work, we have two or three uh, dependencies that we have to upgrade. Yep. Um, so what can you do? Um, so th there is a lot of different tools out there. Sonotype Lifecycle helps with a few of these things, but it's, it's not going to automate your troubles, essentially. And you're right, um, as we consume more and more open source, and we will consume more and more open source as the time goes on, um, it is becoming a more and more uphill battle. Now, there are things that companies are working on, Sonotype included, to basically try and automate this stuff for you. Now, it's a pain to do this, and it stifles innovation where you've got to constantly keep thinking about every dependency update, has it been scanned? Oh, it's got vulnerabilities in. Okay, now, what's the alternative to that? Is there even an alternative to that? Do I have to then go write this code myself? So it is getting more and more difficult, but I honestly think um, companies are innovating more and more, and I think the differentiator between a lot of these companies in the future will be completely automating these processes, so you don't have to think about it. Now, luckily at Sonatype, um, we've been in this business. We, cr we essentially created this, this kind of industry here. Um, we were the first to kind of coin software supply chains and stuff like this, so it's something we've been thinking about and trying to figure out how to do it. Um, so, yeah, I think with the introduction of AI and things like that, I think that will help us a lot. The bad guys are using AI. You can even chat, ask ChatGPT to make you malware, and it will make you malware. So um, the bad guys are using AI and machine learning. Why shouldn't we? So I think they, these are the kind of things that we as developers should take advantage of. I don't think they're going to take our jobs, but I think someone who knows how to use AI might. <laughs> so I think with the introduction and these things becoming more powerful, hopefully they will allow us to automate some of these processes. Um, as of now, what you can do, um, look at stuff like scorecards, what OpenSSF are doing. Um, before you start a project, you know, do a lot of research into exactly what what kind of library you're going with, not just because of its functionality, but because of its history. Has it got a good history of updating and um, fixing vulnerabilities of that? So essentially, just do a bit more research before you start net new projects. Um, if you're working with old projects, it's again just picking the right tools to do the job and try and find more and more tools that will automate as much of this process as possible. Because a lot of it, you know, it's a lot of manual work. It's not stuff that we need to be spending our time doing. And a lot of the tools and AI can do this stuff for us. It's not going to be perfect. Um, one other thing I'd say is make sure you pick a company that has good data to back up what it's doing. Because it's all very well and good having a scanning tool. But if that scanning tool is fed by bad data, it's pretty useless, right? If it's not going to pick up the vulnerabilities, what's the point of the scanning tool? So make sure you pick a company that has a robust data to back up what they're doing. Um, because if you don't, then the tool's really not going to do anything, right? So hopefully that kind of answers your question. It's kind of like I'm trying to delay it for the future, basically, so AI will try and fix this in a few years. Um, but just look for tools that, A, have the right um, data to back themselves up and tools that do as much automation as possible. That's the advice I'd give. Thank you. No worries. Any other questions? Ah, you're all being too kind. I can go have some food now. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed my talk um, and enjoy the rest of the conference.